Hello, hello, and welcome, everybody, to Learn with the Expert. Uh, we are so excited to have you here with us today as we are waiting for everyone to join. We would love to have you introduce yourself in the chat. Please share where you're from, what your role is, your grade level. The chat is located on the right-hand side of your screen. If you don't see it, look at the bottom right corner, in the bottom right corner, and you'll see a little chat icon. Just go ahead and tap on that to open it up. But we are so excited to have with us tonight the founder of the SAMR model, which is a, um, a model for technology integration, Mr. Ruben Puentadora with us today. He is going to share how technology can help us develop the skills and solutions that prepare for unpredictable events while improving what we're doing right now. Before we do that, then, I do have a few housekeeping items for um, us. If you do have questions during the session that you would like Dr. Pointador to answer, please just click on the Q&A tab and drop your questions there. This just ensures that we don't miss any of those amazing questions that you have coming in. If there are any questions that go unanswered, we will definitely reach out to you and answer them after the webinar. All other comments, ideas, reactions, thoughts can be put in the chat so that um, everyone who's joining us today can view them. So again, if you're just popping in, make sure your chat and your Q&A tabs are open. Um, in the right-hand corner, click on the chat icon to open it up, and then you will have the option to toggle between the chat and the Q&A. You'll also notice that there is a handout tab, and that tab will include the handout from today's uh, session. This session is being recorded, so you will receive a link to the recording as well as the handout and the presentation from today and a certificate of completion um, from this webinar in about 24 to 48 hours after the session is complete. So let's see who we have joining us here today. Hi, Kathy from El Paso. Welcome. We have um, Margaret, pre-K through four from upstate New York. Hi, Julie. Welcome, welcome. Michelle, welcome. We have somebody from some people from Quebec on the line. Hello, Nancy. Welcome, Veronica. First grade, Cummings Elementary, Joliet. All right, Joliet, not too far from me. I am located in Chicago. So you're just a hop, skip, and a jump. Hi, Juliet, kindergarten teacher. I'm also a former kindergarten teacher, so I see my people in the chat. <laughs> All right, well, welcome, everybody. Oh, we have Emma from Singapore. Welcome. So definitely are representing from all over um, the world. So thank you for joining us. So now that um, we know who you are, let's introduce our team here. So I am Mia. I am the training and professional development specialist here uh, at Seesaw. And as I mentioned, I'm a former kindergarten teacher and um, I am based in Chicago. So welcome everybody. Um, and at Seesaw, we believe that effective integration of technology really makes those new learning experiences possible. So that's why we're so excited to have our expert with us today. So without further ado, let's introduce our expert. We are honored to have Dr. Ruben Puentadora, who is the founder and president of Hippasis, a consulting firm which focuses on transforming applications of technology in education. He is the creator of the SAMR model, which is a technology integration model used for selecting, using, and evaluating technology in education. Ruben is here to share a teacher perspective of learning technologies today to discover how technology in our schools and classrooms can not only be preventative against unforeseen events, but truly transformative. So welcome very much, Ruben. We are so excited to have you today. Thank you, really. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. I'm very, very happy to be uh, with all of you here today. So let me tell you a little bit what we're going to be talking about today. What I want to focus on is thinking about learning technologies today, a teaching perspective, but this is going to be a presentation as we're going to see in several parts, because the first part of this is going to be why. Why do we want to use technology in education? Now you could say, well, of course we have all of these advantages. There are things we can get from it and so on that we couldn't get otherwise. I know this in the chat, some of you are already familiar with my SAMR model, so you know what that says. 
But I have to be honest with you. Uh, the urgency of incorporating technology into education has increased since I originally created the SAMR model. And in particular, that was driven home by the pandemic uh, where you know, everybody had to very quickly go into emergency remote learning when the pandemic started. And then over time, different, I know we have people from different countries, so different countries with different approaches, different regions within countries, et cetera. But it, no matter where you were, technology played a key role in how education and educational initiatives progressed during the pandemic. We are, in effect, now living in a black swan world because it's not just the pandemic. It's a whole series of things. And that's where I want to start. I want to start with the world that has made it uh, not just desirable, but frankly, necessary for us to look at how we incorporate technology in education and how we make that make a real difference moving forward. So... Black swans. A black swan is an unforeseen event, cannot be predicted. If you can predict it, it's not a black swan by definition. And it has a major impact on the way things happen, the way things are conducted, etc. And of course, this affects education like anywhere else. When you have a black swan event, there are four possible paths that can happen after the event, right? The worst one is existential risk. Existential risk is when your institution or the project or program you're working on ceases to exist as a result of the black swan event. And that's of course the worst case scenario. A common one is what's sometimes called near-term risk. That's when you come out from the black swan, but with some damage. In other words, you come out from the black swan event, not in as good shape as you went in, with some issues in terms of what you couldn't do, what you'll be able to do moving forward. It may affect how many people you're working with. It may affect uh, what, if you can under, uh, what you can undertake. It may ha mean that projects that you had worked on have had to be canceled or delayed indefinitely. So that's near-term risk. So neither of those is obviously a desirable outcome. The one most people talk about is the third, resilience. And resilience is basically when you come out of a black swan event much the same way you went in. So you say, we made it through, and we're pretty much the same we were after the black swan that we were before the black swan. And that's the one people focus on, but it's actually not necessarily the single most desirable one of these. And the most desirable one of these is what Nassim Taleb, who created the whole terminology around black swan, calls anti-fragility. And in anti-fragility, you come out of a black swan event better than you went in before. So you're able to do things you weren't able to do before. You're able to do some things better than you did before. Now, people ask, wait, does this mean a black swan event is good? No, I'm, what I'm saying is that a lot of things happen. So we saw within the pandemic, a lot of things that were hard, difficult, sad, tragic happened. But some institutions were able to pick up new skills, new competencies, new approaches to things that then they've been able to continue using in the world after the peak of the pandemic and to come up with new approaches, new ideas based upon this. But the thing is, anti-fragility doesn't just happen. You have to seed the ground for it. You have to prepare the context for it. Now, uh, one other thing that people sometimes say is, okay, it, it, we get why anti-fragility would be desirable, but what about just sticking with resilience? Isn't that good enough? And the trouble is, if you slip from anti-fragility, if you plan for anti-fragility, but you slip a little, you're still in the resilience world. So you're still okay. But if you plan only for resilience and you slip from that, then you fall to near-term risk. And sadly, you can even fall lower to existential risk. So while it's prudent to just say resilience is good enough, in fact, it's actually a fairly risky strategy in a world such as the current one, where one going to point out is we're not just looking at one source for black swans. It's not just the pandemic. Rather, it's a whole series of different uh, contexts. And this is what I call the nesting grounds for black swans. So we have climate change is one. What we're seeing with climate change worldwide. Pandemics, not just obviously COVID, but other pandemics. We are already seeing some discussion of whether bird flu, for instance, could become a pandemic, but there are others, ranging from 
Deng, uh, etc., depending on where you are in the world. And finally, the whole aspect of human movements. In other words, the fact that humans don't stay put. And this uh, refers to everything from migrations to immigration to emigration to refugees to uh, situations such as sharp increases or decreases in the population of a region in a country. So th I'm encompassing all of these, including also whether people are living in cities or in towns, etc., within an, uh, within this uh, nesting ground of human movement. So we have these three external nesting grounds. And then we have three internal nesting grounds that have to do with how people use technology, how people work, and how people want to live. So those are what I call the future present of IT, the future present of work, and the future present of living. And because all of you are teachers, one of the things that's important to me is that we come away from this with something you can take away and not just say, okay, that's generic, but to think a little bit more about how will you do two things? How will you start thinking about how you might shift content that you might be including as a result of having to include these elements on the table, but also how you teach that content, how your students learn that content, how your students use it and interact with it. So let me go a little bit more in detail into each one of these. I mentioned climate change. These are figures from uh, the IPCC report. And what I want to point out is that the two lowest curves are the ones everybody wishes we could make. They're the, what are sometimes called the 1.5 degree curve is the lowest and so on. But the truth of the matter is we're most likely on a path to the middle curve. Now, that means that depending on where you are in the world, you're going to see either, as you see on the right-hand side, more frequent hot temperature events, or you might see more frequent heavy precipitation events, or you might see more frequent droughts. It depends on where you are. It depends on your context. But no matter where you are in the world, this is going to affect you. So start thinking about, well, what will your students need to know to handle a world in which uh, climate is not a steady presence, will not be throughout their lives, will have more of these unusual events, will create more context where they have to decide what to do, react to it, etc. Similarly with pandemics, one of the things we have to realize is pandemics are no longer localized. They are globalized. They are in a world that is interconnected. And because of that, as we saw with COVID, things spread very quickly, diversify very quickly. And then once diversified, re-spread. And this is today. I always update this slide before I make a talk, if I'm going to talk about pandemics, because I want people to realize that it's not that you've seen a, a landscape where you say, well, COVID has stopped mutating, has stopped spreading. That's not what we're seeing at all. We continue to see changes. We continue to see changes in which a variant is present where, and this would be true of any pandemic. So again, think about this. What type of skills, what type of thinking skills do students need in order to be able to comprehend this type of world? What type of knowledge do they need to have about the world? Clearly, they need to understand the world. They, they need to understand that where they live, of course, has certain characteristics, but what are the places that they don't live? Do they have right now a real image of those places, or do they have something that may have been collated from media, film, stories, etc., that is not really connected to a reality? So again, give that some thought. I mentioned a human movements. Now, I picked the USA here, but I could have just as well done this with uh, some other regions of the world. The World Bank has equivalent. I just want to show just one source of migration patterns. As climate change occurs, people move because they have to. Either areas in this particular uh, study, it's a question of sea level rise, either go underwater or are so affected by coastal changes that they are no longer easily inhabitable or at least inhabitable in the same way they were before. And what you see here is something that shows over the balance, the next 75 years, what is expected to happen in the U.S. And for those of you who live here in the U.S., you can see that you have everything from areas that are affected very directly, if you're on the coast, of course. But notice that about half of the U.S. is affected to a degree where the local population she sees increases in the deepest red areas, for instance, over 9% increase in the local population as a result of displacements of other populations. So again, what does this mean? 
How do we have students think about these migratory patterns? How do we work with students? In fact, how do you create a certain sense of continuity when your students themselves may be moving from one region to another, may be, in fact, themselves part of these migration patterns? So those were the environmental. Now let's look at the relational nesting grounds, right? So let's talk first about what's the future present of IT. And information technology is progressing at a galloping pace. I'm just throwing you, showing you here three key components that in one way or another affect how you teach today, how your students interact with the world around them, and how they will enter further education or the workplace tomorrow. And you have social media, which you see here on the left. And you can see that it's not by any chance, by any uh, stretch of the imagination, a simple or monolithic picture. It's a picture that's very diversified according to uh, socioeconomic status, according to location, according to age. And again, if I, if I try to show you this for the world, I'd have to show you a different chart like this for every country in the world, because in fact, there are significant differences in this. But this world is one that your students are interacting with and will interact with and will interact with. So one of the questions is, how do you bring elements of this into your teaching so that they become elements of learning in and of themselves? Because we all know, of course, about the problems with misuse of social media. But what about talking about how we work with students so that they learn how to use social media effectively and powerfully? And the other two that you see there at the top, you see artificial intelligence in this particular form in the, in the form of generative AI for images. And what you see there is part of a study I'm doing right now, which is a study on uh, thinking about what could schools look like in terms of a world with climate change, in terms of a world where solar power, wind power, other forms of energy become more crucial. And where also we start to incorporate other elements. For instance, what we learned about ventilation and space during the pandemic, et cetera. How do you bring that in? And in particular, I'm exploring the idea through the lens of an architect, uh, Antonio Gaudi, the Catalan architect, who himself did design, in fact, the school back in the 1930s. But uh, so this is, I'm using artificial intelligence to help me think through this, to generate. Not one, not two, This the backdrop behind me, the one you see on that, I want to have thousands of images I've generated to explore the idea, to think about what might be possible. I'm sure all of you have heard about uh, ChatGPT. I am not going to be talking about ChatGPT. If any of you are curious, I'm giving a talk next week on ChatGPT. I'm participating in a discussion forum. But uh, we also have that as a tool for artificial intelligence that can generate text, that can generate integration of text, what do we do with that? What works? What doesn't work? What do we have to look out for? What can we benefit from? And then finally, the third element here to keep in mind as you're thinking about the future present of AI, uh, sorry, of, a, of uh, technology, is the whole aspect of the physical computing. And this is, for instance, a little 3D model, which I'll just show you. I have it right here, too. So it's not just a simulation. That really is a physical model. So the fact that we can use 3D printers to take ideas and project them as physical objects into the world, but we can also interact with the world via extended reality, et cetera, to superimpose information on it. So we're looking at a range of technologies and technology uses that go well beyond what we've had in the past. And again, you might use some of these, might use a few of these, might not use more, any of these for a particular project. But as you're thinking about how do we construct learning experiences for our students, how would you do something relative to, say, each one of these? How do you bring physical computing or social media or artificial intelligence into what you do? How do you teach students to use these responsibly and well, to use them creatively so that they can expand what they are thinking about? Future of work. One more thing, I'll just make this very quick. As we look at the future of work, we're not looking at jobs which are monolithic. We're looking at jobs where things become not so much occupation-based. It's not like saying you are X. You're a teacher and you do all of these things. You're a truck driver and you do all of these things. You're an engineer and you do all of these things. But rather, your job becomes segmented. Some segments are handled by technology. Some segments are handled by new groupings, new partnerships with other people. This is different. This is a world of team making and team breaking, 
teaming up with technology in a sense that our students have not had an experience with, that we haven't had an experience with in many cases. So again, what would you create? How would you create special team-based tasks that might relate to this? How would you create tasks that have your students use technology so that they're using it as a partner rather than as something that takes over something completely or conversely, it's just a very remote tool, but you're doing all the heavy lifting. And last but far from least, how do we want to live in the future? Now, there's lots of things that have been discussed. You know, the people have talked about, for instance, uh, the, that people don't want to go back to work in an office. And right now we seem to have stabilized, at least in the U.S., at around 50% office occupancy, uh, regardless of what businesses have said to workers. So that's a component. that Lots of these have been talked about. But I always like to show something that people don't necessarily expect. And in the context of the pandemic, you've seen a lot of bad news, frankly. But there's also been some good news. And one of the things that has shifted during the pandemic is that we're seeing, or we have seen during the pandemic, more benevolent acts, more positive acts in 2020 and 2021 compared to 2017, 2019. In other words, the pandemic appears to have brought a shift in how people interact with each other. In some contexts, this is, I, I want to be very careful. It's not uh, suddenly everybody is 100% kind and charitable. No, but in some contexts, in some uh, aspects, such as helping a stranger, volunteering, etc., we are seeing a very real, definitely significant, definitely measurable increase in these benevolent acts. So this has to do with, well, how do we want to live moving forward? Clearly, we seem to have learned something that appears to be good, as a result of the pandemic, how do we strengthen this? And again, how do you build this into your classroom, into your teaching, into the experiences for your students? So this is what comes together, these six nesting grounds. And I've tried to give you a brief intro to all of them because I want to talk about all of these things from your perspective, from the perspective of a teacher. So what comes next, I want you to have this in the back of your mind and think, okay, so this is how this relates to that. This is how this relates to thinking about how we use thinking about these nesting grounds so that even when the black swan hasn't struck, even when it still is somewhere in those nesting grounds, we're already ready with the work that we're doing with students, with how our students are learning, with what our students are learning. This is an example from a talk I gave two months ago in Stockholm. And this is what people asked me to talk about because it was a context of other presenters. And you can see that we have all of these triangles, right? With AI, because it becomes a key aspect of the world that you're inhabiting, each of these triangles. And each of these triangles poses some type of a new development that will relate to jobs, invention, technologies, what your students will be interacting with, but also challenges. So look at the one in the bottom right, for instance, health technology and ageism interacting with AI. Health technology will allow us to better deal with some of the uh, illnesses, troubles, problems that can accompany old age. But ageism can also come to the foreground if not carefully controlled for, if we don't learn better how to avoid this. And if we don't accidentally, in the process of creating all of this, create, if you will, a cult of youth. So this is just one of many examples. I'm not going to go into all of the diagram. But this is an example of how these things come together when you're thinking about the future, when you're thinking about the world your students will inhabit and how these nesting grounds help shape these types of interactions, these types of challenges moving forward. Because at the end of the day, you can talk about how to make a unit of instruction anti-fragile, a course anti-fragile, a degree, whatever your degree granting level is anti-fragile. You can talk about how to make an institution anti-fragile, but your teachers, your faculty, your educators, you're working with learners, you are learners yourselves, the question is, how do you make student learning anti-fragile? And that's what I want to talk about in the second part, because I want to talk about building anti-fragile learning. Okay. I mentioned a lot of things were learned during the pandemic. A lot of things came out during the pandemic that, even though the pandemic itself was tough, tragic, difficult, etc., nonetheless were important. One of the things that came out that was important is the fact that to build anti-fragile learning, using technology, and technology became essential during the pandemic, 
you need to be using it not at levels at which you're just doing the same old things you were doing before, but at levels at which you're doing new things. And those of you who know my model, the SAMR model, know that, of course, this is what the SAMR model is all about. In other words, I'm going to briefly review the model in the context of something that came up during the pandemic, but very briefly right now, one of the things that came up from the pandemic is that uses of technology at the lower le two levels, substitution when you're using it to do the same thing you were doing before, or augmentation when you're doing what you were doing before, but you're doing it a bit better with a bit more polish or with some details or aspects you weren't embarking upon before. Those are great for getting up to resilience. But, but if you want to get into anti-fragility, you really need to be pushing into the upper two levels of SAM, into the modification level where you're significantly redesigning a task and the redefinition level where you're creating new tasks that were not conceivable before without the technology that actually change your outcomes dramatically. So this is the model. As I say, I know some of you know it, but I also want to make sure we're all on the same page. So let me show you an example that relates to the pandemic. And that is during the pandemic, we went at different points into what you could call a hybrid state where some things were face-to-face, -face, some things were online or remote. And the things that could, were face-to-face -face or remote could fall into one of three categories. It could be the location, where the student was, where the teacher was, where the environment was. It could also be the resources that were being leveraged, whether they were online, physical resources, okay? And also the content, where did that content reside? Was it something local? Was it perhaps an observation a student could do in their backyard? Or was it something online that they were accessing a shared content with other students? And each of these could be mixed in different ways. So for instance, you had students working with physical resources in an online context. You had them working with physical books, physical paper, physical instruments in an online context where they were sharing discussions, et cetera, like that. So the three of these don't all need to be all online or all face-to-face. -face. They can be a mix. But this is a hybrid world. And one of the things that then uh, we decide is, okay, so we define a hybrid mode of learning. Some students, uh, for full hybrid learning, you're talking about some students being online and some students being face-to-face. -face. Some instruction takes place synchronously. Some instruction takes place asynchronously. And you can have changes in which students are face-to-face -face or which students are online over time. Okay, so this is a hybrid mode of learning as opposed to pure face-to-face -face or pure online. And what we found is that there is a scaffolding that can take place so that we can look at this hybrid aspect and say, how do we use the technology to get the best results, the most mileage, etc., out of what's going on? So let's use the SAMR model to help guide this process. So substitution. Here, we're saying, okay, we're replacing what we were doing before, talking with students, meeting with students face-to-face, -face, and now we're meeting them online, all right? And what we did is we switched to Zoom. Or, sorry, Zoom was uh, the most common platform for most of the schools I worked with, but obviously other platforms, whether it was Google Video or Teams or whatever platform, it doesn't matter. So I'm just showing Zoom here as an example. But... Uh, one of the key things then is that what you had is robust telepresence. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to say, let me do as good a job interacting with students in this virtual world as I did face to face. Now, this is one of the places where I say substitution doesn't necessarily mean 100% mimicry. Okay. One of the things I, that we found, for instance, is that you did better if you didn't have the students just staring nonstop at the camera. Uh, for the, exactly the same amount of time without any pauses, interruptions, etc., as you would have during the day. Rather, you had to create special rhythms, special changes, etc., so that uh, you could make the best possible use of that telepresence. So it's important to realize that substitution doesn't mean 100% mimicry. It means that you're doing the same, achieving the same goals using the tool set. All right. So far, so good. And augmentation, you start to see more impact, okay? So small impact, but nonetheless measurable. And in terms of what we saw during the pandemic, in terms of how to use this hybrid spaces, is where we have what I'm calling shared conceptual spaces. So here, for instance, I'm showing you a concept map and having students be able to interact 
work together within these conceptual spaces online. Why am I calling them conceptual spaces? I'm saying, well, they're just sharing a document. Because the improvement of the augmentation was to say, well, hold on. Because some of the sharing is taking place synchronously, some of it may be taking place asynchronously, you can think just a little bit, not just as to saying, how do I make the students make this shared slide deck or shared concept map or whatever it is online, but actually how do they improve their exploration of concepts together in this online uh, space in ways that are a bit different and a bit better than what they would have done if they had only had, okay, we've got the concept map, we're looking at it in class for the next half hour, work together in teams, that's it. So that's where the whole aspect of shared conceptual spaces comes in, and this is at the augmentation level. So now we've got our video platform, now we've got shared spaces that the students are working on. What takes us above the line? What takes us to the place where we start to see uh, true anti-fragile practices emerge? Well, this is where we start to see new ways for the students to interact. Now, remember what I said a few minutes ago about different teamwork and so on? One of the things that online, face-to-face, -face, particularly if you have hybrid and particularly if you have both synchronous and asynchronous modes, is it allows you to start to explore the different types of enhanced social networks I'm discussing here that come from different team building activities. And what I'm showing you here is a social network map analysis tool. You don't need that, obviously, necessarily to set the, uh, the teams, but like if you're trying to analyze what's going on in your class. But one of the things this allows uh, for you to do is to say, how can you create new structures, new explorations for team formation, team breaking, team making, et cetera, team dynamics that you couldn't have done otherwise. So you're significantly redesigning the task. It's not just now a slight enhancement to teamwork. It's significant redesign of the whole aspect of teamwork. And that takes you to the modification level. Finally, at the redefinition level is when you say, what can you create with the technology in ways you never could have before? And here is where the beauty of having students inhabiting different spaces comes into full play. Or even if they're inhabiting the same space, what they can do when they are in those different spaces at different times. So what I have here as one possible example, there are many I could have chosen, is the idea of a shared live space. And you can do this within YouTube Live. You can do this in any real live uh, creation uh, platform. And here I have one student who is creating music. That's a little synth that they've built that you see on the lower left-hand side. Remember what I was talking about, the physical okay, aspects of computation. Okay, so here I'm bringing in so those physical aspects of computation. And the other student who lives, but because of, I will assume, some type of distancing due, whether it's to a pandemic or a climate event, et cetera, can't come physically to the school. And they're presenting a space they are particularly fond of. This happens to be the Clark Art Museum, which is near where I live, uh, but could be any space that has some meaning to a student. And between the two of them, they're creating something jointly that they could not have created without the technology, whether it's the accompaniment for this physical object that creates music and so on that a student has designed to their specification to complement the work they are creating as a performance, an online discussion, an online presentation around the space. So these are new tasks. These are tasks that we could have said, well, the students could have done some, they could have done some performance, certainly that would have been great. They could have made something together that would have been great. But this type of sharing across space and time in ways that integrate the physicality of computing in ways that integrate what the students can say about this is where I live, this is what matters to me, and this is what matters to me right now, that I'm not just telling you when I'm here and that's there, then that becomes a task at the redefinition level that we've seen very good use for, very good results from this type of task during the hybrid mode uh, imposed by the black swan of the pandemic. So that's a review of the SAMR model with this in mind. Now, to complement the SAMR model, I want to give you a brief intro to another model that, again, I think some of you are familiar with, but not all of you, and that's the EdTech Quintet, because the SAMR model says, okay, this is how you use technology. The EdTech Quintet says, well, what kinds of technologies are there 
and what should we do with them? And I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction here. I, I, we, you know, I want to make it clear that there's you know, plenty of uh, additional you know, exploration we could do within this. But to, for today, I just want to get a little bit of the lexicon and get you thinking about the range of these five technologies that are particularly relevant, important, powerful in education. There are social tools, mobility tools, visualization, storytelling, and gaming. Let me go into each one very briefly in more detail. Social tools refer to use to communicate with each other, share things with each other, create things jointly with each other in an online space. All right, so that's class number one. Class number two, mobility, refers to the fact that the devices we're talking about, as we found out during the pandemic, well, not found out, we <laughs> had to leverage during the pandemic, are usable anytime, any place. And that means that was crucial for being able to make hybrid modes or uh, distance modes work properly in education. But it also means that we can think about, yes, this device in the physical world. I remember I just showed you the student that shows you the place where they live live from that space. The student that creates something physical that interacts with that world. So mobility refers not just to the fact that the device is nice and portable, it is, but to the fact that it is a device within the world it's a device that can be used any place, any time. Visualization refers to the fact that we have abstract concepts that we introduce to students. We introduce them to a concept like space. We introduce them to a concept like time. We introduce them to concepts like number. And co abstract concepts are challenging because, you know, if I want to say, uh, what's a cup? I can say, here you go, this is a cup. Okay? And I can show students a lot of cups. I say, okay, I get what a cup is. But what is a space? Eey. That's a little bit more tricky, but we have tools for visualization that we can use on a computer that allow for exploration of these spaces. So tools for exploring space are called digital maps on a computer, for exploring time, a timeline, for exploring number, tools for simulation, visualization of data, and so on, and even tools for visualizing text, which can be tools for visualizing, for instance, the frequency of uh, words in a particular text, or how words sequence each other, or even tools that tell us how things are connected to each other. So if what's being connected is ideas, we call those concept maps. If what's being connected are animals in an ecosystem, we call them food webs. So these are five major categories. There are others, of course, but these are five key categories of how we can use the technology to take abstract concepts and make them more tangible, more easy to understand, richer. Storytelling refers to the fact that we can use the technology across this broad swath that you see on screen of different domains, different aspects to tell stories. But why do we care about telling stories? Well, if I'm telling a story, I'm making meaning for somebody else. But in making meaning for somebody else, I make meaning for myself. So stories are a great way to integrate knowledge when I'm sharing it with others, but also, and in some ways, I would almost argue primarily, for myself and the technologies allow us then to tell stories across a broad and rich range of domains. And finally, we have games and people say, oh, why are games powerful in education? Well, because they're fun. That's actually less, it is a factor, no, make no mistake. But it's also the fact that a game provides a challenge. What I'm calling here, or rather not me, Selin and Zimmerman, uh, who did a lot of research on games, call an artificial conflict, but not a conflict as in you know, fight or something like that. A conflict is a challenge, something to be resolved, something analogous, in fact, to the type of conflict you find in a novel to find out what resolves the initial conflict of a novel. You read through a novel to resolve a conflict of a game, you play the game. And if you can tie that conflict to the learning that students should be or might want to undertake, then you have something very powerful indeed because that challenge drives the knowledge. And what I always tell people is, if you use a simulation, you have students understand cities, for instance. A simulation of a city is already very powerful, and that will be in the visualization category. But if you can tie it to a game like SimCity, the learning goes through the roof. Because now the conflict of how do I build the biggest city, the wealthiest city, the most green city, whatever it happens to be, that challenge, that conflict drives the learning. So these are the five categories. Again, as I said, uh, as we already, uh, as you already heard at the beginning, you're going to have all of these slides. So of course you can go through these in greater detail. But as I'm talking through what comes next, which are going to be some examples related to this, to how we use SAM or how do we use the EdTech with that, keep the whole range in mind. Keep this in mind as you think about how you might use 
tools, technologies, etc. And I also wanted to tell you to think about Seesaw not just as a file cabinet, okay? But to think of it as a true learning management system. Now, I know that uh, different people will say, but uh, to have a learning management system, you have to have feature X, which might relate to transcripts, for instance, or something like that. Yeah, but to me, the key aspect of learning management systems and how I would encourage you to think about a tool like Seesaw in that context is how the tool can be used to structure knowledge. And just the two screenshots I have here. On the left, think about how this structures social interactions, what's already feasible, but not just how would you use Seesaw to say, okay, have exactly the same chat you would have had before, but have it online. But say, wait a second, can I use the tool differently? Can I use it to structure some collaboration differently? And on the right, you have all the range of tools. And again, if you just say, well, just have the students put the video here and put the drawing there, and each of these is a, a response, so it's like a little file cabinet where you put stuff, well, that's better than nothing, and it's useful, of course. But again, can you use this to help students visualize how they can integrate these different aspects of technology? How it's not just their photo or their drawing or their video in the same way that you might have in an earlier era, that their worksheet or what have you, but are how all of these come together. Can you use the links to bring in some things that are not in Seesaw, but can be linked into it, can be brought into it to complement it? So I encourage you to think about Seesaw as a learning management system, as a platform that can do this. And uh, this is, to me, one of the reasons I'm very happy, uh, frankly, that Seesaw is hosting this, because this is an important aspect about how to think about the tool set, not just as a file cabinet, but something that scaffolds, that can scaffold the type of learning we're talking about. So I'm going to do three quick examples here of applying SAMR to think about the types of challenges, the type of aspects that we talked about in terms of modalities. And I'm going to do this in progressively for progressively older students. So the first one is going to be from pre-K to elementary. The next one's going to be from elementary to middle, and the last one's going to be from middle to high school. But all of these could be adjusted for different age groups. You'll see that the general idea, the general template uh, is applicable as you apply across ideas. It's just obviously the sophistication and the depth is going to evolve as your students also uh, gain deeper learning skills, etc. So let's assume we're talking about literacy, okay? And one of the things we need students to think about is really about story, not just because of what I just told you about the ed tech quintet, although that's an aspect, but think about all of these aspects, those six nesting grounds and black swans. And remember I told you black swans are not predictable. One of the key aspects of story is the aspect of metaphor, that which allows you to take that which you have in your story and allow to take your mind from a place where it is right now to another place that might be different. That skill of learning how to use story as metaphor, as uh, this little you know, machine for taking your thinking from one place to another is essential if you're going to build in anti-fragile learning. So let's get it at it by building deep relationships to story from the get-go. And as you're, again, as I'm going through this, think about how you do this with your students. So substitution. Your students are accessing stories that they love in online resources like YouTube or what have you. Again, could be videos imported into uh, Seesaw, et cetera. Augmentation. You might have students that are pre-literate. You might have students that don't know yet how to read and write, but they can still record something and add their images, et cetera, to review a book that they heard about, a book another classmate of them, of theirs maybe, made. Now that's an interesting thing in and of itself. So you're teaching them to think about this as a reflexive activity, even from the get-go. This, by the way, is one of the most successful things I've seen used over the years in uh, working with early reading learners, You know, getting them to learn how to say, well, not just I liked it or I didn't like it, but this is what I liked and why, or this is how it links up to something. Again, this is part of scaffolding, that process of building a thinking of story as metaphor. At the modification level, now you can say, well, let's bring all of these together into a social domain, a review club, 
where all of these reviews are grouped together and you're using them and people are saying, well, I like your review, but I disagree with yours on this one. And again, this is also an important habit of social interaction, the respectful disagreement, the respectful agreement, how you build from this, the earlier build it in, the better. And finally, a redefinition. Now you can say, well, so far we've been talking about students talking about our story. Can they themselves construct stories? Of course, we've always had students tell stories and so on. But can they use the features of the technology, such as voice recognition, such as, again, tune in next week if you're curious about this, aspects of chat GPT or similar AI agents to help them construct that which they might not be able to do yet at this level, but aspire to, et cetera. Craft the personal story in a way that they could not have using the technology, share it, you've got this platform, et cetera, uh, in ways they could not have. And now you're at the redefinition of that. So this is an example of how to think about some of these elements, some of these challenges I mentioned before. How, in this case, how to build metaphor, but how to do it through something you're doing already, namely teaching students how to read and write. Elementary to middle. Now let's talk about science and think about the science that's involved in climate change and how to think about climate change. That is not just study how to do the standard textbook problem, do the standard textbook problem. It don't work that way, folks. I'm sorry. You need your students to be actually able to engage with real data. You need them to be able to engage with, let's model it this way. Hmm, that's complicated. Maybe we can simplify the model that way. Well, if we have this, climate change in particular has also a question of trade-offs. Remember I showed you the curves. I said, well, we'd all love to be on the lower two curves. We're probably going to be in that middle curve. But one of the reasons that we have to uh, decide how we go about being on any of those curves is we have to decide about trade-offs. There is no such thing uh, as a decision about climate change that doesn't have some trade-off involved. And again, we need students to think about this and they need to think about the fact that sometimes there is no simple answer. It's going to be based upon values, objectives, goals, desires. Again, the get students thinking like this, the better. So let's see how we could do this in the context of a science unit where, for instance, they might be running their own greenhouse, but doing a few things are a little different. So at the substitution level, replace the standard textbook with more flexible, more up-to-date, more directly connected elements such as podcasts, texts created by other schools, our institutions, our faculty, our students, et cetera, uh, professional greenhouse growers, uh, people that do urban horticulture. For those of you who live in cities, uh, I've had great experiences working with schools that uh, in areas where urban horticulture is practiced, et cetera. So this is, however, just substituting to develop a base, a core knowledge base. Now remember that we need to get students thinking about both how to deal with data, but also how to think about these trade-offs, how to think about building up the knowledge. So at the augmentation level, we need the students thinking about, okay, I'm going to have a greenhouse. How do you do things like grow lettuce? So we have the students have to find out, they have to research how to grow lettuce, and then they have to create resources for others saying, hey, we're going to be growing a lot of lettuce. Let me make the tutorial about lettuce growing here and share it with others. But you also need them to think about, well, tactically, because you can plant lots of things, but how do you go about optimizing how you plan? What are the trade-offs involved? In other words, you're thinking about the tactic level of thinking of the individual activities, optimizing those activities, choosing one over the other. This is not yet coming together. We'll get to that in a second. But it's a key aspect, getting tactical thinking on there. And games, uh, this one, for instance, there are many games in this uh, family, the Cooking Mama, series this one, this is a a chef uh, series, etc. But all of them focus on the what's the sequence of events that allow you to do one basic thing. So this is tactical thinking. And you want the students developing that tactical thinking in parallel with the how do we take the components that will make up our greenhouse and get them ready to go. Modification level, now let's build out to, you guessed it, strategic thinking. What are the thing about how do these things come together on the game side? Now you're looking at things like uh, Dino Dash and similar games, where what's happening now is how you integrate all of these things together. And in terms of a greenhouse, you have to, or a garden plot or whatever it is, you have to think about, well, once again, trade-offs. If I'm going to have a harvest because, hmm, I don't want to just eat it. I want to 
sell some of this. So we have some money for the class trip or to you know have a party or whatever it is. So let's think about how we're going to create a greenhouse that isn't just random tomato here, bit of lettuce there, and that's it. But it all comes together. So now we're thinking strategically. We're thinking about how we take each of these things and say, well, this crop requires a lot of water. So if I'm going to be watering this, why don't I put next to it another crop that requires a lot of water so we figure out how to get efficient distribution of water rather than putting one that requires really dry soil? Do I plan what's next to each other in terms of harvest, pests? Can I use one crop to block others from pests? That's strategic thinking, and that's what's happening at the modification level. At the redefinition level, finally, you're talking about saying, how do you pull this all together? And this is what's involved in that type of thinking that's related to climate change, because you need to integrate across disciplines. There is no single discipline. Yes, of course, climatology addresses climate change, but there is no single discipline that has all the knowledge of economics, social studies, uh, just things such as a botany, biology, a different forms of a ecological thinking, biology, uh, you know, just all the bits and pieces that come together require cross-disciplinary integration that goes to a level where all of that tactile and strategical thinking that you've developed comes together to address this. And again, we're not asking the students, let me be very clear, we're giving them a rich palette because they can use this for climate change, but they can also use it in the future of work, for instance, to decide for themselves, how will they integrate those pieces? that will come together in their more fragmented future. How do they bring together different resources if they're looking, for instance, at, uh, say, how they might live so that what they want out of life is as rich, powerful, and beautiful for them as possible. So here you see a game that integrates more along the lines of trade-offs. So this is one of the many, this is uh, one of many sims of what uh, now we're going beyond the diner dash, you're actually running a family of diners and you know, they haven't paid to trade off. Well, I'm investing more in this one, customers want more of this. So now you're bringing in the economics, the trade offs. I may have to sacrifice some of the development here so I can put it there. So you have this type of cross disciplinary aspects, et cetera. And you also have the students using the data, as you see in that spreadsheet from the greenhouse, to actually say, hmm, this is growing, this is not growing, this is selling, this is not selling. And that's how you build upon that. So that's example number two, which as I say, grows to how do you get that richness of thinking? Example number three is uh, the middle to high school level. And uh, Cynthia, I'm sorry, I don't know why the captions are not aligning. Sorry, if any of you uh, have trouble with the captions, this has just come up in the chat, uh, refreshing the screen might take care of it. So, okay. So uh, finally, the last example I want to talk about in terms of the history uh, aspect of how to think about history at the middle to high school level is to bring in this rich matrix of concepts because all of these come into the picture. We are thinking about things like human migrations. We are thinking about things like what's the past, what's the future? How do I work with the future? How do I work with different aspects of what comes together. So I need a richer aspect of history than just, unfortunately, you know, memorizing a few dates, a few places, or just saying, well, this happened and this happened. You need the, all of these things coming together. And very briefly, we can talk at substitution, bringing in a palette of resources, everything from videos about a historical phenomenon here, for instance, the Silk Road, all the way to the archeological data. So now you have students, not just dealing with the textbook pre-processed, this is what you think about that, but you have a rich sense. And yes, some of these are summary resources, the YouTube videos, for instance, from the crash course family of videos, they certainly fall into that, but it's not the single simple monolithic. And you start to incorporate the, what type of rich re self resources do you need? Augmentation you have then a question of these tools for visualization. Remember I talked about them? Well, if you're going to understand, as I showed you in that map, the impact of those migrations, of how people will move, who will need a job, who will need education, how they will relate to a place where the culture around them is changing as you look at it, this is something that you need to think in terms of maps, 
and timelines. And that's what I'm doing here. Again, here I'm applying it to the Silk Road. But this is the type of thinking that you need the students to be applying to, to address these questions, these issues using the technology. At the modification level, now I'm going to take a little sidestep and say, wait a second, Ruben, you have two books there. Where's the technology? And the answer is, maybe you don't need the technology, but the technology has seeded the stage for a particular approach to the teaching of history, which uses that game aspect I talked about in the EdTech Quintet. This is from what's called a, a Reacting to the Past, RTTP for short, approach, which was developed by Mark Carnes, in which students role play historical events. But this isn't role playing in the sense of a student uh, sets up on stage and says, I am George Washington crossing the Potomac or whatever historical figure you like. Rather, these involve debates, actual trade-offs, actual people with passionate positions on both sides of an issue, on multiple sides of an issue, on how things have evolved, uh, how things happen. And you have the students actively debate this. Now, you might think, this, does this work? Beautifully. There's a ton of research. Uh, showing that not only does it work well, and again, all you need to do is go to the Reacting to the Past site, and of course, you'll have the slides, you'll have the link from that as well. But not only does, do students get it, they get it in a sense in which they suddenly develop this type of nuance and this type of historical criteria related to that matrix I showed you earlier that says, how do you need to think about these as processes to get what you want? And finally, a redefinition is when you say to students, congratulations, you are now a historian. And you have students pick different topics that they will now construct using the technology to visualize complex interactions, to source documents they couldn't have sourced otherwise, to analyze data such as satellite pictures. For instance, you can do some amazing stuff with that. So here I have a student working on Cahokia, and this student is being a historian using everything we've talked about in the context of how to bring all of that knowledge together in a creative historical way. All right, I've given you some examples. I'm going to wrap up by just showing you one last thing. When you're talking about all of this, we've gone into the SAMR model, we've gone to the Ed Quintet, we've gone to how to address those uh, six nesting grounds, we've gone to why you want to do this, You've got all of that, but there's one more thing. At the end of the day, you need to find out, is this working? Is this closing the loop? Now, people say, well, we could give them an exam and so on. Sure, but I want to encourage you to look at formative assessment, to look at types and shapes of formative assessment so that you can have evidence be used, not just after the course is done, so people say, well, this is doing got an A, B, C. No, no, so that the student and you and the peer group all can make decisions and change and evolve the process of learning. So it's not just, okay, this is what we did, this is what we covered and that's it, but rather it becomes responsive because you know what? Anti-fragile thinking requires fragility, requires, uh, it re it requires anti-fragility requires the type of thinking that evolves, that feeds back, that involves this type of interaction, this type of formative interaction. And you've got the slides, I'm not gonna go much into this, but very briefly, for instance, you can use an item known as a concept test, just to give you one quick round to close this out. And that in and of itself can become an aspect where you give students a multiple choice test about a topic. Okay, so you first introduce a topic, substitution, then you give them ways of exploring, visualizing the topic. In this case, we were talking about a topic, for instance, in Shakespeare. So you're looking at visualizing it through the lens of a word cloud. Again, think of what I was talking about. So you've got that rich perspective. But now you give them a multiple choice test. And instead of just saying, well, you got it right, you got it wrong, you have them talk with each other. And you have them discuss with each other. And you know what? In the concept test method, that both gives everybody formative assessment on, oh, this is what I understood. This is what I didn't understand. And it gives you a better base for moving forward than if you'd stopped everything and explained what was right, what was wrong, etc. And finally, of course, once you have that, you can once again focus on creating a personal response to a creative text. And if you noticed, 
I kind of bracketed this symmetrically because I opened with the pre-K to elementary learners, people learning to read. Well, here we're talking about Shakespeare, so in the middle to high school domain, showing you yet another lens for bringing all of this together. So that's it. Those are the topics I wanted to cover. I wanted to tell you about black swans, why we want to think about anti-fragility, what's the nesting grounds for black swans and how we need to respond to them, and then talk about how SAMR and the EdTech Quintet give you the tools for responding to this. There are some additional resources on the slides. Again, these will all be available to you in the email you get tomorrow. And this is my contact information. And at this point, for I want to thank you all for coming. I, I, as promised, I will answer any and all questions. If we don't get them to them today, don't worry. I'll answer them in text or I'll make a recording. You will get the question answered. But for those of you who want to stay, thank you so much. And I'm ready to take your questions. Uh, me, I'm not hearing you. I'm sorry. I think you're... All right. So let me look at the Q&A. And let's see. So... It... Let's see, we have two questions. Looks like we have a question up here, Ruben projected on the screen. We have some teachers okay. and colleagues at our school who are hesitant to use technology or Seesaw. What would you say to get them on board? Maybe what kind of SAMR related response to that would you very, say to get them on board? Very good question. One of the things I like to do, and for those of you, by the way, who might be able to join us again on Thursday, I'll be talking a little bit more, hopefully, about that, is I like to work with teachers so that they build from where they're at. So one of the things I ask them to do is not just leap in and say, great, uh, create something at the redefinition level from scratch. Say, hold on, let's start with what you're doing. And then ask, what's right now? Something in one of three categories. One possibility something that is not quite working for you right now, a place where the students get stuck. A second category, something you love about your subject, something you really want to get across, but you'd like to do it even better or more effectively than you're doing right now. And the third one is, if you had a chance for your students to make sure that they had one key issue in mind, one key idea in mind, what would it be? So pick one of those three, which are towards the forefront of any teacher's mind and say, okay, Let's see how we can use technology, how we can work together to build up what I call a SAMR ladder to get to it. So you start out not trying to go straight for the definition, say, okay, what are you doing right now? What would replace it? Substitution. Then look at those aspects that you'd either want to make a little bit better about what you're communicating or address where there might be difficulties and say, how can we enhance things? You still leave the activities, et cetera, much the same, but you improve them a bit. Now you're seeing the technology in that sense, your augmentation. At modification, now you say, well, okay, you've improved it. Couldn't you now do something a little differently? Couldn't you just rethink? Isn't there something else you could do with the technology, bring in something else, your modification? And finally say, okay, what do you really, where, where would you now, your heart's wildest dream want to go at and you go to redefinition. And you want to do this, if at all possible, in teams so that people realize that they're not alone. So you want to have teachers work together. I generally do these uh, when I'm doing, uh, when I'm working in schools with teachers. I do this in groups of three to five people. Fewer than three, you don't have enough different views to really get the creative juices fully flowing for what might happen. More than five, things start getting a little cluttered. You can go up to seven. I have done it up to seven, but that's about the size of a group. So what I would say is the water, you know, it's the, the old joke uh, about, you know, not only is the water in the pond absolutely wonderful and welcoming, but also there are so many things that you can do that you can create. And frankly, I have to be honest with you, that's from the perspective of the what you can, but also in the perspective of, as I said, the aspects of what is changing 
I think it's also important to remind people who are hesitant to get on board that just like we had to do this during the pandemic, we will have to do this. And if we can do this in a way that is not emergency oriented, but rather is, oh, we were already developing and we just enhanced it, expanded it, etc. That will also be better. So I think it's a combination of both making sure that there's a gentle scaffolded ladder, the aspect of teamwork among teachers, but also finally the important realization that this is not in the long term, frankly, it is not sustainable to not incorporate technologies into the picture. Well, thank you, Ruben. Hopefully you can hear me now. I can hear you now, yes. Okay, I apologize for that, but thank you for jumping in. And I love what you said about being ready, being um, proactive as opposed to being reactive, really ready for the future technologies and those nesting grounds. Thank you for um, an amazing session. Thank you for jumping in with questions. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, we would love for you to share your feedback on this event. Um, we use that feedback to bring um, additional events and topics to you and um, make sure that we can cater these events to um, your specific needs. So um, we will be sharing a link to a feedback form right now in the chat and it will also pop up when the webinar ends. Um, I do realize we are a couple minutes over so you have if you have to jump off that's okay. This is being recorded. As a reminder you will receive the recording in an email um, shortly after the session ends. Um, but if you can stick around for these last couple minutes that is great. So we also have a resource for you um, that um, just that has some key takeaways from our session today um, about how to redefine your classroom technology using Seesaw and SAMR. And you can find this resource in the handouts tab. We're also going to drop that link in the chat and we will share it with you in the follow up email. So once again, I just want to thank you, Ruben, for joining us. Thank you for rolling with the punches with the technology issues. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today um, and see you again soon here at Seesaw.